Hi, I'm Jonathan. We're in our Dumbo Brooklyn showroom, OMA and Fleetwood Sound. I want to talk about the OMA Ironic speaker, which is coming a little late because this uh, has been a, a limited edition of 10 pairs, and we're getting to the end of the production of this speaker. Why it's a limited edition, unlike the rest of our speakers, I'll explain in due course. This speaker actually has really quite a story, and um, I want to convey that to you before I start, though. I'd like to say this was a totally crazy thing to make. This is a crazy speaker. E even with the respect we get now, people come in here and they go like, that's, what's that? That's not a speaker, right? And then I say, no, it's a speaker. And they're like, no, it's not. Even people who know OMA, they don't take this seriously because, you know, you, you have these preconceptions about what a speaker is. Maybe it's a box. Maybe it's an ugly MDF box with a lot of shiny paint on it. But maybe it's a horn. Maybe it's an electrostatic. But whatever you have in mind for, it could be a Sonos soundbar. Whatever you have in mind for a speaker, it ain't this. However, this is a highly engineered thing, speaker, and it's actually one of the best sounding things that we've ever made. I'll explain why that is in, in shortly as well. Um, probably the best place to start, what is it? It's an open baffle speaker. There's, there's no box. We're going to come behind in a little bit, but just take my word for it right now. This is a cast iron structure. It's one piece. So this was cast at, at um, our foundry, OK Foundry, in Richmond, Virginia, as one piece. And uh, it's a two-way speaker with a 15-inch field coil woofer, I'll, I'll explain field coil, and a, a, a very custom, um, very high efficiency ribbon tweeter. So there's no enclosure on the speaker. There's no box at all, to, which is how bass is, is enhanced in, in speakers. Um, why you want a box is another thing that we should discuss. But um, this, this thing, people say it looks like, you know, a work of art. It was designed as a numerical or actually quadratic diffuser. What, what's that, right? Well, um, a numerical diffuser is a seemingly random organization of shapes of dimensions that will affect various frequencies and diffuse them in, a even, um, in an even way. So you see them in studios on walls and on the ceiling. In fact, we were just at Josh Bonatti's mastering studio last night shooting, and the, the diffusers have all these seemingly random, made out of wood uh, shapes. They're square pieces of wood, different depths, and the sound goes in there from the speakers in the studio, hits these, these, these panels, and it breaks up, diffuses, and it does it in a very um, uh, seemingly random way so that you, the waves, as they come back out, they're not, they're not direct reflections of what came in. And that is really important so that you're not confused by what you're hearing in a studio space or, frankly, you know, in a listening room. So these quadratic diffusers have always been made out of I think a bit wood, um, plastic material, styrofoam. Um, they've typically always been made geometrically, meaning squares, rectangles, because it's just easier to manufacture that kind of thing. And people make these things to, to sell them or they put them you know, into their studio. They don't care about how things look. When we did this, we we decided to, and I'll explain why that is too, we went with round shapes. So you have these seemingly um, 
random round forms of different diameters and they've been engineered and designed between uh, you know the largest diameter and the smallest to um, diffract different frequencies. Uh, why, why did we make this thing in the first place? People make speakers, so th we have a real company, right? I'm not doing this in my, in my garage. It's not a one-man shop or a DIY thing. We have a pretty big, we have a 40,000 square foot factory at this point. So we are actually a real company. But this is, this story is actually really interesting because it kind of shows you how different we are from other speaker companies. Because other speaker companies would look at what's on the market and, and say, well, we want to make something like this, but a little bit different so that we, we you know, we identify ourselves, but we're not so far away from everything else that people are scratching their heads. That means that we were crazy to make this because this is so far out, it's not even, it's ridiculous. Another way that, that, that speakers, you know, become, get developed and, and come to market is, is somebody was playing around with the design that they really liked and they thought, this is so good, uh, we have to productionize this and, and, and bring it to market because people will really want this. Because look, hear how great it sounds and look, it looks good too. So that's another way. That didn't happen like th with this. The way this speaker happened is, is like crazy pan stuff. Um, it's a two-way speaker. So I, I was um, in contact with a jukebox dealer uh, this is a long time ago, who I would buy old tubes from. And he calls me up one day and he says, Jonathan, I've got, I've got 20 of these super rare um, field coil 15 inch full range drivers that came out of a very old, like a pre-war jukebox. I'm not gonna go into the, I've said it before, I'm not gonna go into the brand name, it's a famous brand name of jukebox, okay. So he says, Jonathan, I've got 20 of these woofers. They're all in pristine condition. And um, would you be interested? And um, let's, we might as well come back here and take a look at, at, at this, this woofer. The only thing we've done, besides clean the cones and do a little restoration on the surround, is we repainted the cap and, and put the protective cloth on. But I'm putting my hand on here and it's warm. And that's because this is not a permanent magnet. Inside of here is a magnet, it's an electromagnet. It's made out of coils of wire. And there's two sets of cables running up, up to it. One is a, D, is a DC power supply that energizes this electromagnet. So it's very, very powerful and it has a unique sonic signature because of that magnet type so one cable is feeding the DC, and the other cable is the signal, of course, to this driver and to this ribbon. We'll talk about the ribbon in a bit. So he says, I have 20 of these. You interested? And I said, yeah. I mean, how did it, to find one or two of these drivers is really, really hard. In fact, I haven't seen one in years come up for sale. Um, so I said, yeah, I mean, how did, you, how did you get 20 of them? And he said, yeah, it's a really sad story. This, this old guy who was, he was a, a, like a jukebox repair type guy and he had a big territory in the South. And he had all these jukeboxes which were really rare, but they were really ugly because they were for like, poor people in juke joints. People who could never afford a jukebox at home, right? They would go to the juke joint and hear music, uh, the latest stuff on 78s, and, um, and then, you know, live music. And those, um, he, he, had, he had a whole bunch of these jukeboxes and he got 
tired of having them in his barn, so he took out what he thought was the valuable part, which was the, this woofer and the triode amplifier, and uh, burnt the rest of And the jukeboxes were worth a fortune. The drivers, not so much, at least not at the time, and sold them to this guy. And so, you know, this guy like, just chopped up, you know, half a million dollars worth of stuff um, for nothing. But I bought, I bought the, um, the woofers. And the reason I did that is because I knew that this, these particular ones and some similar ones uh, are totally unique transducers because that jukebox in the late 1930s had to produce a lot of sound for all the people you know in the juke joint and it had to do it on a, only a few watts of power because those those triode amps 10 watt amp right and um, the box wasn't really a, a juke box it, it had no back it was an open baffle type speaker. It was a U-shaped, but uh, the, they would position a bit off the rear wall, and the rear wall would then reflect the, the rear wave, and this would join in a small enough place with the front wave so that it feels like it's one thing. And, you know, that made a sound, a really special sound. The cone on this driver is incredibly stiff and very, very light with a very stiff surround. So it, it really barely moves. It's also extremely efficient. It's well over 100 dB, one watt, one meter, um, which is unheard of for anything like this today. It did not go low because 78s, there's nothing really below, say, 70 hertz, 80 hertz on a 78. So um, this is a driver that was supposed to reproduce the full range of the music that was on a 78 nearly 100 years ago, but didn't have to reproduce really low bass. And of course, there was no high frequency either, so to speak, on those recordings. So the, the thing didn't have to, to worry about trouble. Really, it was about mid bass, upper bass, I should say, and mid range. And it did that unbelievably well. Like when you hear this thing, you just say, what's that sound? So I knew that these things were capable of amazing sound. I knew that we needed to make an open baffle speaker with them. But I had some problems after I bought them. One problem is, if I'm going to make an open baffle speaker, um, which I wanted to do because I wanted to do something different. I didn't know I wanted to do something this different, but I wanted to do something different with, with this speaker. And I figured, well, I only can make 10 pair of these, so let's just make something really interesting. It's a limited edition. And uh, my, my thought was to do something like 2001, A Space Odyssey, that, that black um, monolith that's... That, that slab, which the, 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 the monkeys, the apes are like, you know, it's an amazing scene, the opening scene of 2001, Kubrick Space Odyssey, something like that. And I was thinking about slate because we used a lot of slate and uh, I could get those pieces of slate from the quarry and I needed something that was extremely heavy and well damped. And that's because if you do an open baffle speaker, you need to have... There's a rule of thumb, which I'll just say, even though I've kind of kept this quiet, you really want to have about 5,000 times the mass of the moving mass of the, the transducers for the, for the baffle. And uh, that's, that's heavy. If this is a 50 gram or less, I think, cone, uh, 5,000 times that would be about 250 kilos. And that's about exactly what this is. So you want something that's not going to be set into motion, into vibration by the movement of the drivers. There are open baffle speakers out there being made today. They're typically made out of wood, these sheets of plywood or things like that. And um, they suffer because they, they move around, they resonate. And this was designed to not 
vibrate and resonate sympathetically with the transducer. So we needed something that was really heavy and really well damped. And that's slate. Slate's just perfect. We were using it for, for the turntable plinths and uh, chassis. We were using it as the grill in front of the Imperia. So I thought slate 2001, we're done. Well, no. We had another problem. Because this is so efficient, but it doesn't go high, and we're making a modern speaker, what are we going to do for a tweeter? We needed something above um, 3, 4, 5K, I forgot where we're crossing over, um, that was really efficient to go with this field coil super efficient woofer. But there wasn't any such tweeter. I looked at everything. I, there's plenty of tweeters that if you horn load them, they will be that efficient, more, way more efficient. But I wanted to have the profile not have a deep horn sticking out the back of this thing. So I was looking for a, basically like a direct radiator type tweeter and nothing like that existed. I was talking about this problem I was having with my friend Alex, who's the founder and, and CEO of RAL, a company that makes the world's best ribbon transducers. They're in Serbia and they make the, um, the ribbon tweeter that we use on the AC1 speaker, for example. And I was telling him about this issue because he likes interesting problems. And he says to me, well, Jonathan, I'll make you that ribbon custom. He said, it'll be large, this large. It'll be expensive. It'll be difficult to make, but I will make it for you. And indeed he did. And he made the world's most efficient uh, and um, really incredible sounding ribbon tweeter, which uh, this thing is, uh, I think, about 110 dB at 10K which is remarkable. So now I had the, the driver that inspired the design. I had the ribbon, but I needed to do, you know, the baffle. And I was talking with David D'Imperio, um, our designer. And uh, David always has a very different take on things because he has nothing to do with audio. This is a great designer. So I said, you know, the slate and here's my idea. What do you think? And uh, David, being actually creative, says, well, does it have to be flat? And I was like, come on, David, it's slate. It's flat. You know, it doesn't have relief. And he says, well, does it have to be stone? And I'm like, you know, if it's not, it has to be heavy. Can it be made out of another material, David asks. I said, yeah, potentially. He said, can it be made out of metal? And I thought, well, I, I hadn't thought of that. And uh, I thought, well, maybe. And David reminded me about um, the people from the foundry, James O'Neill, who had visited me and you know, said that they were interested in working with Oswald's Mel Audio and uh, had also told me about some really interesting new technologies for making castings that I was completely unaware of because you know, I'm not in the castings world. So Jamie explains that they can now 3D print a sand mold to cast something, whereas before, and there's videos that we have, because we've been down to the foundry and, and, and photographed how, and video taped how various things, that other things they make are done. So they, they take a pattern and they push it into the sand and pull it out, and then those two parts go together and the cavity is where the the metal goes. Okay, that's straightforward. There's no way to make a pattern for something like this. But the 3D printing process, you can make um, a pattern of anything. And it doesn't have to have draft because it's not a pattern. They just print the hole. Well, they, they print everything but the hole, I should say. So I started to realize and talk to Jamie that, you know, we could become quite experimental in the process to make uh, a metal and a cast iron, because we want it to be heavy, um, baffle. Also, Jamie explained to me some of the alloys that they use and that the hypoeutectic gray iron, 
which subsequently we've used a lot. We've used it in our K3 turntable, for example, uh, and in the SP10 plants. Hypoeutectic gray iron is, is cast iron that has a, f a formulation with a lot of graphite crystals in it. And the graphite crystals, which you can see under the microscope, basically shear sound waves as they go through the material and break it up. That's why it's used for things like photolithography machine bases. It's a really, really good material in terms of it being well damped. So here we had um, the right material, and we had a way to do it that we could do almost one-off castings. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. And I said to David, you know, well, if we're not going to do something flat, then let's do something like a quadratic diffuser. And I spoke to Bill Woods, and Bill loved this idea. And I said, has anybody ever done this? Has anybody ever made a diffuser as the front baffle, the front of a speaker? And he said, I don't believe so. I said, Bill, is this a good idea? Bill said, it's a really good idea. And I'm not going to go into the front edge baffle distortion on speaker design. It's a really interesting subject. Since most speakers today are so narrow and thin, they don't even have a front baffle. What you want with a speaker in general is as wide a front baffle as possible. With an open baffle speaker, obviously the thing has to be quite large, although I see some companies and people have tried to make open baffle speakers that are really just as big as the, the driver. And what happens is the, the wave coming out of the front of the speaker meets the wave coming out of the back of the speaker, the two cancel and you lose a lot of bass. So this is not a good idea. What you want with a baffle speaker is something as wide as possible. In this case, we used the entire um, space that the, the machine, the 3D printing machine, uh, can, you know, has in its bed. So it, it's kind of like a, one of these inkjet printers, right? And it literally is this tall, the bed, and this wide. So we maxed it. This is as big as that machine can make a, uh, a 3D printed mold. And um, we started to look at ways to make the quadratic formula with shapes work. And, and David said, do, do, do these have to be rectilinear? And, and, and I looked into that, and the answer is no. So we, we started to look at, at round shapes. And I'm not, this could be an extremely long video. I'm not going to go into um, you know, th th this in, into too much detail. But the, this, is, this is the design that we settled on. And uh, people get sometimes confused that these are somehow reflective devices. They're not. Um, but it, it does work extremely well in terms of diffusing the sound. So David created the design and then we meticulously transferred it into CAD and, and, and got the molds printed, which was very, very difficult thing to do. And um, now you got to remember that the furthest that we could take this design in prototyping, we, we didn't have a Cray supercomputer, so we did simulations but they were very elementary, rudimentary um, uh, simulations. We built a, a wooden mock-up roughly this size and shape, but with that we could not, you know, we're not going to do, we didn't do these. And just tested that, and that was, that was okay. But there's no way that we could actually prove this design, which is something I will never do again. And uh, we went down to the foundry when the first mold was ready to film and, and photograph and see the casting being made. And um, this was a, a moment I'll never forget because I was on the gantry with the, you know, where they're pouring the hot metal. And again, you can see some of that in some of the videos we've done at that foundry. And uh, the huge guy with these enormous asbestos boots on like, like a linebacker type guy, uh, really great guy. He, he's the guy who pours the molten metal into the, into the mold. And uh, they wanted to pour the metal really hard, meaning very fast, 
because I'll explain, and, and you can see on uh, our website how this is made. There's a, the mold, and you can see a funnel comes out of this big sand mold, and they have to pour all the metal, right, in that mold. And they have to do that so that the metal goes along here, and it goes through what's called gates into, f I think, four places in the, in the mold. And then the, 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 this liquid red-hot metal has to make its way to the far end of the mold. And if it's not, you know, doesn't reach here and here at the right temperature uh, quickly enough, then you get, like, the, 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 it, it didn't come out. You know, you get holes and pockets and it's ugly. And these molds cost thousands of dollars thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's extremely expensive. And once you pour it, the mold's done. So if, if you screw up, you can you reuse the metal, but you know, you, you're out a lot of money. And uh, uh, I watched as they sort of dumped all this red hot metal into this funnel. And the next thing I know, because I'm, I got a lens, you know, I got the, the eyepiece on, on my, you know, I'm looking through the lens, f f videotaping this, and I'm watching this guy jump back faster than I've ever seen anyone jump. And he's a huge guy in these big boots. And that's because white hot metal, white hot liquid is shooting out the seams of the mold like this. And you know, if that gets on you, you're done. And then the cables going to the, 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 the thing that heats up the metal catch fire and people are running around with, and I'm going like, oh shit, this is not good. And they blew out the mold. And I thought, all right, that's great. I bet the store, because I invested a huge amount of money in this, I bet the store on something that I can't even make, let alone what it sounds good. I have to be the dumbest, you know, ever to be do like, what am I doing? This is not, you know, I'm running a business. I'm supposed to be making a product. And here I am making this thing, which you can't even make it. Very depressing, I'll, I'll skip to a bit later and Jamie figures out how to pour this and obviously we've made a bunch of these so look, the, the, the suspense was lost because you know, here I am with it. Uh, the next thing was, okay, how does it sound? And that was terrifying because I realized, okay, I got past, you know, making, we, we were able to make it, but now what if it sounds like shit? Then what? And, um, we, we had to, to do some work on the, the network, but it's a pretty, it's a simple network. Um, and I was, you know, very, very apprehensive, but it turned out to sound just absolutely incredible. I, I've literally had people cry listening to these speakers um, because, they, because they have no box the time domain representation is so accurate. It's so beautiful to listen to. I found I was listening to instruments that I never listened to before, really listened to. So not, not long after um, we made these and I, I got them here in the loft, I was listening to early, some early Dylan. Uh, I think it was like, Don't Think Twice. So it's just Dylan and the harmonica. And then I'm reading something in Absolute Sound and the reviewer starts talking about Dylan's harmonica with quotes, Dylan's harmonica. And I didn't realize, so these reviewers in these magazines have this term for piece of music that there's an unwritten law in the audio reviewing world. Don't ever put this music on if you're gonna review something because it makes the, the, the speaker sound like shit. And Dylan's harmonica is that, is that, is that term, that's like a shibboleth, um, meaning it, 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 it'll make you run out of the room. And there I was, and I was listening to Dylan's harmonica, and I'm like, this is fantastic. And then I catch myself thinking, why am I thinking that this is fantastic? Oh, because it's not supposed to sound good. And then you listen to harpsichord music, for example or anything with very rich, difficult transients and, and harmonics. And 
this speaker, because it has such effortless time domain um, representation, it just nails it. So you get this crystalline, effortless, you know, it's this like celestial beauty, given the right recordings and music, of course. Um, low bass it does not have, although Apple did the iPhone 6 commercial here, and they basically twisted my arm and did a rave scene with 50 kids jumping around a techno using these speakers with no bass reinforcement. And I told them, if you blow the woofers, you bought the speaker. And they said, yeah, well, it's Apple, so you know we're not worried about the budget. Uh, I think that actually did make it into an iPhone 6 commercial. But they're not something to play like techno or hip hop. Um, open baffle speakers are dipoles, right? They're radiating the sound from, from both Go over to this one from both the front and the rear. That means that the room is really playing a significant part. And here's the funny thing. I, when I had these finally done, I didn't have any place to put them, so I set them down here until I could figure out what I was going to do, and I was not thinking that they'd really even work because this speaker sees a sidewall, but this speaker sees nothing. There's The rear wall is... We haven't tuned it. It's just plunked here because there's no place else to go. Um, none of this is correct or ideal. It's not a sealed room. There's no room gain. And there's non-symmetrical boundaries. So I didn't think these would sound good. And they sound stupendous. They sound even better in people's homes when we've installed them um, where they do have a real room. So they will play the room, but they actually work even here. And um, so that means they're a bit more versatile than I would have thought. My biggest regret, oh, this was the original crossover network, and that is the original box that supplies the DC. Don't look at these anymore because I don't want you to get, this is gone. I decided that, and there's cables that are running around, I don't like that. So what we did is, on every production pair after this, we built a new stand and we put the power supply and the crossover network into the stand. So now there's none of that. You don't have any stuff on the floor. Everything is contained behind the speaker and uh, all you have to do is, is, um, uh, is plug it, is attach the speaker cable to it and plug one, plug one of them in. So um, it, it cleans things up. Biggest problem with this thing at this point is that when this is done, I'm going to be very sad because uh, it's, it's such an amazing speaker, sonically. And then for somebody who just doesn't want a speaker or enjoys the stealth aspect of having one of the world's best speakers, but having it look more like, and yeah, people say art. We don't make art. We make speakers. It's design. So they have to function. They have to function really well. And if they look amazing uh, and people say it's art, then, then okay, I'll, I'll take that. But we, we don't make art. But it's kind of an art object. And for the person who like collects art or something, they appreciate art and they appreciate great sound. You know, this is amazing, but I can't get any more of these woofers. And I don't want to use vintage parts anymore. Anyway, so... Um, Maybe in the future, we'll figure out a way to design something like this using modern drivers. Maybe not. I think that it's just really interesting to share with you why this thing exists in the Ome lineup, how it got made, because it sheds light on a different way of thinking about things, which is not driven by so much by commerce, but by sort of a, a creative, inspired you know, desire to, to find out, like, you know, how good can we make something? Um, and uh, also the name, well, ironic, it's iron. I don't think I have to go any further about that.